Time is an illusion and time waits for no one. While humans have tried to control the world around us, one thing we can never control is the passage of time. We can never change the past and we can never know what the future may hold. This is one of the many reasons why time travel stories resonate so much with many people around the world. All time travel narratives, no matter when and where they are set in, are really about the time and place of when the story was written. Back to the Future 2 was more about 1980s American pop culture than it was about predicting how 2015 would be, regardless of how many predictions they got right. Futurama was about satirizing America of the new millennium and not speculating of what life would be like in the next millennium. Then you have the butterfly effect, where the smallest of actions have an impact in the grand scale of things. The choices we make, no matter how small they are, matter. And with stories set in the past, the distance of time can allow for topics to be explored in a way that reflects our modern world and highlight how far society really hasn't progressed. Hey, Tarek. Yeah, Amber? If you had the chance to travel back in time, who would you rather go meet? President Washington or Abraham Lincoln? Hmm. <laughs> it's been joked about a lot that black people time traveling to the past really isn't ideal. The past is not the safest place for us to have fun hijinks with racism rising to more messed up levels depending on how further back you go. If I ever got hold of a time machine, I always said that I'm going to pre-colonial Africa and I will go to the Oba in Yoruba land, you know, the Benin Kingdom, all up and down West Africa to be honest, and I will sit and wait on the coastline for any Portuguese ship I see and it will be sunk. So, so basically exactly what Jax did in his ending of Mortal Kombat. Actually now nah, I'm going further back than that and stopping the Arab slave trade from happening there too, okay? And that's on Shongo and Oya. I never realized how easily people could be trained to accept slavery. Pulled back in the past on a plantation, on the plantation where I think our family were owned as slaves by the Waylands, and, and I don't know how or why, but she's trapped there and she needs her help. Kindred is the best selling novel by renowned science fiction author Octavia Butler, first published in 1979. The story follows Dana, an African American woman living in 1976, California, with her white husband, Kevin. One day, Dana experiences a sudden bout of dizziness and gets transported to a Maryland plantation in 1817, where she meets a young white boy named Rufus, the son of a plantation owner. Dana rescues Rufus from drowning and is then brought back to present day. The second time Dana time travels, she saves a slightly older Rufus and learns that he is her distant ancestor. Dana also meets a young girl named Alice Greenwood, who was born free and lives on the outskirts of the plantation with her mother. Dana learns that Alice is also her ancestor and realizes that her maternal family are the descendants of Alice and Rufus's child. Dana comes to the conclusion that the reason she is time hopping is to ensure her family's lineage. All of this creates a weird moral quandary for Dana when Alice becomes enslaved as punishment for the crime of trying to help her husband Isaac escape slavery and then is bought by Rufus. Rufus is not a good person. He causes harm to the lives of every single person on the plantation and Dana could stop him, easily kill him with a weapon brought from the present, but doing so would erase the entire existence of her family. All that Dana can really do is her best to help with the everyday lives of the people on the plantation, whether it's giving them modern medicine and secretly teaching some of them how to read. Dana tries teaching Rufus compassion as a child, but he grows up within this institution of slaveholding. And even though he learns that Dana is from the future and that slavery was abolished, he doesn't become like Robert Carter III, a real person who had a spiritual awakening and freed over 500 people that he owned, which his peers at the time saw as extremely unusual. White people like Rufus and his father before him were the norm. Dana is not alone in her travels. She is joined by her white husband Kevin and to keep herself safe they pretend that Dana is Kevin's slave and while in the presence they try to forge free papers for her. 
Through Dana and Kevin's relationship, the novel addresses certain issues that can arise within interracial relationships. 1976 was nine years after Loving v. Virginia. Dana and Kevin have a consensual relationship that's based on love and respect, and they are juxtaposed with the violent, non-consensual relationship that enslaved women were forced into. Through Kevin, the novel touches on white privilege. As a white man, Kevin can enter 1817 and will be relatively fine. Comfortable, in fact. His intelligence won't be questioned. He is treated with basic respect. His life isn't constantly in danger by merely existing, so he can see the wonders of time travel instead of the horrors. Kevin wistfully talks about the possibility of witnessing important historic events, much to Dana's bewilderment. This could be a great time to live in, Kevin said once. I keep thinking what an experience it would be to stay in it, go west and watch the building of the old country, see how much of the old west mythology is true. West, I said bitterly. That's where they're doing it to the Indians instead of the blacks. He looked at me strangely. He had been doing that a lot lately. Colorism is another issue that gets touched on. In the present, Dana's aunt prefers lighter-skinned people and is accepting of Dana and Kevin's marriage because of the possibility of light-skinned children, once again highlighting the comparisons of the past and present further as one of the ways Dana helped people on the plantation was delivering mixed babies that were conceived via rape. The majority of black people on the American continents who are descendants of slaves have some percentage of European DNA because of the sexual assault committed on their foremothers was extremely common. But there is a difference in knowing that as a broad fact and knowing the name of the slave owner that harmed your ancestor. Angela Davis was on an episode of Finding Your Roots and a clip went viral when it was revealed that Angela Davis had an ancestor that came to America on the Mayflower. She expressed shock and... The reaction to that clip, mm, and the reaction to that clip from white conservatives where they were laughing and using it as some type of gotcha and basically making fun of her as if she was realizing her entire work was invalid. Like that whole shit really pissed me the fuck off. This is me editing. So I initially went on a five minute long rant about how stupid the whole thing was, but I decided to just cut that out. Um, what I am going to do is link this article written by Callie Holloway. Please read that instead and maybe watch the whole episode in full. Okay, let's get back. Octavia Butler is such an iconic name in Black American speculative fiction. It's hard to talk about Black science fiction without mentioning her. But as prolific and influential as Butler is... Her work has never been adapted for film or television. There have been other adaptations of Kindred in the form of an audio play starring Alfre Woodard back in 2001. Then in 2017, it was turned into a graphic novel by Damien Duffy and John Jennings. You can thank them for the visuals that I'm using in this video when talking about the book. So when I saw the trailer for the 2022 miniseries, I was really shocked that it was actually happening. A handful of Butler's works have been optioned over the decades, but nothing has come from it. As of the making of this video, there are four books that have been optioned and are in varying stages of development. The Kindred miniseries covers the first three chapters of the books and has made many adaptation changes. The story is now set in 2016. Dana and Kevin are not married but are in a new relationship and Dana's mother Olivia has been added to the story and she is also a time traveller who is stuck in the past. I thought some of the changes made a lot of sense. Butler set the original novel in 1976, the year that marks the United States Bicentennial, and it was contemporary to the time it was published, 1979, and spoke to the current issues of the day. 2016 was a very tumultuous year, especially in the USA, um, mm-hmm. but it also marks the end of the presidential run of the country's first black president. Dana and Kevin just meeting and being thrust into the situation creates a lot of conflict and they can focus more on how their race and gender places them on the social hierarchy in the past and the present. Kindred was not renewed for a second season, which is unfortunate. Do I still recommend that you watch the series? Yeah, I guess. It has gotten some mixed reviews from many fans of the book for many reasons, and I understand why, but it's always best you know, to watch something for yourself and decide how you feel. It's a very tough watch, although it does have a few moments that are lighter in tone compared to the book. 
The book, on the other hand, is pretty grim. I classify it as a horror novel, and despite how grim the book is, it could have been worse. Octavia Butler said that she used real slave narratives for research, but had to leave out a lot of the more gruesome accounts in order for the book to reach a wider audience. What always fascinated me about Kindred compared to the other time travel stories is that Dana frequently returns to the present where very little time has passed regardless of how long she spent in the past. Just imagine how jarring that must have been to be pulled into that time period and experience enslavement, being in danger every second of the day and having to witness some of the worst things imaginable. And then, in an instant, being brought back to the present day and seeing how many of those injustices that occurred during slavery really hasn't changed all that much. Every time Dana returns from the past, she is scarred physically and mentally. While in the present, Dana tried hard to educate herself on that time period by reading books about slavery, but all that she could find in the library are books that have been watered down and sanitised for the benefit of white people. Or worse, books that pretend as if slavery wasn't that bad. If the miniseries had continued, I'm sure we would have gotten an equivalent scene of Dana watching TV and seeing a fool like Kanye West saying that slavery was a choice. Or possibly going on social media and seeing ridiculous takes like this. Statements like these definitely come from ignorance and viewing history through media designed to make white people comfortable. So if you are black and have said something like this before... I suggest you read slave narratives and research on the three R's, revolts, rebellions and resistance, because they were happening across the diaspora every damn day during slavery and colonisation. Read the memoirs of people that lived through Jim Crow laws or talk to your elders who lived through it. The Montgomery, Alabama bus boycotts in America lasted for 13 months. The Bristol bus boycotts in the UK lasted for four months. A lot of people were inconvenienced in big ways to affect change and progress. South African apartheid ended in the 1990s. The funny thing is, Octavia Butler was inspired to write Kindred when she was still a university student and heard a young man who was probably very new to the black power movement express his disgust at the older generation for enduring abuse and being submissive when faced with injustices and how his current generation is extremely different than his parents because they would not have backed down, they would have fought back. <sighs> Time really is a flat circle. Given the heavy topics being discussed, I thought it would be best to insert a little breather in between some of the segments. Introducing the Good Vibes Interlude. I love The Black Knight. I have watched this movie more times than I can remember and will just randomly quote lines. Who be ye? Who be I? I'll be stomping your ass. You put your hand on me one more again. So if you haven't seen it, Martin Lawrence plays Jamal, who works at this medieval Ren Faire type of theme park. And through some unexplained magical mishaps, he gets transported to a fictional medieval England that's a few generations removed from King Arthur's reign. If for some reason you have never watched this movie, but the plot sounds somewhat familiar, it's because it's one of the many loose adaptations of Mark Twain's novel, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. I don't care what anyone says, Black Knight is the best one there. Way better than the one with the little white boy and the one starring Whoopi Goldberg. Now, another reason why I love this movie is that it's more historically accurate than you would think. The people of this medieval land aren't shocked to see a black person there. They assume that he's a Moor, no different than Sir Morian of King Arthur's court. I'm from South Central. Florence and Normandy. Normandy? Uh, a thousand pardons. We've been awaiting word from Normandy. Please, enter. We'll inform the king of your arrival. And this dance to the music scene. As far as I'm concerned, this is just an exaggeration of actual events. So a quick history corner. During the Tudor reign, there was this black trumpet player called John Blount, who was employed under Henry VII and Henry VIII. He petitioned King Henry VIII for a pay increase and got his wages backdated for when he worked from the former king. John Blount did not play about his money. And that is why he is an icon of black history. <laughs> Yeah. 
Time loops are one of my favourite plot devices. You would think the constant repetition would be boring, but when executed well, it can make a story all the more captivating. The go-to emotion that these stories can elicit is frustration, obviously. Being made to relive the same events over and over and over and over again can be its own version of hell for the character enduring the repeat, or for the audience watching it. <laughs> no. No. That's why the most memorable and popular time loop movies are comedies like Happy Death Day, where we can laugh as the main character descends into madness. I think that time loop stories are so engaging and show up in so many mediums around the world is because they appeal to that universal feeling of regret. We all live with regrets and the desire of wanting to go back to fix our mistakes, especially when second chances aren't always guaranteed. This is probably why we often see teenage girls as the protagonists of time loop stories. Teenagers face a lot of pressure and adolescence is the period of our lives where we are more prone to making loads of mistakes, some that can greatly impact the rest of our lives. And girls don't really get the same leeway as boys to mess up. It wasn't hard to find a time loop movie with a black protagonist. In fact, I was spoiled for choice. So I decided to pick See You Yesterday. Today is June 29th, 2019, and this is our fourth test on our temple relocation pack mark one. If this works, we will time travel back one day into the past. During our jump back, we have agreed not to make any major changes as to not break the time-space continuum, possibly altering the future in ways we could never imagine. See You Yesterday is a film directed by Stefan Bristol. The screenplay was co-written by Bristol and Frederica Bailey. It was based on the writing duo short film of the same name released back in 2017. Both the short film and the 2019 feature length version were produced by Spike Lee. See You Yesterday follows two young science prodigies, Claudette Josephine Walker and Sebastian Thomas, CJ and Bash, best friends who are building a time machine which they hope to present at the Science Expo. Their teacher, played by Marty McFly himself, Michael J. Fox, has a conversation with CJ and asks her to consider the philosophical and ethical issues that could arise with time travel. If you had that kind of power, what would you do? What would you change? Like many teenagers before her who were bestowed the ability to control time, CJ immediately uses it for personal gain. In her case, getting back at an ex-boyfriend. In the original timeline, Jared insults CJ and she slaps the piss out of him. This scuffle spills out of the bodega and they stumble into CJ's brother Calvin, who intimidates Jared into leaving. The film subtly alludes to the butterfly effect without a lot of info dumping. It's pretty clear that the first time that they went back and CJ threw the slushies at Jared, it created a new timeline that resulted in Jared chasing them down the street and ends up with him getting hit by a car. A few days later at a party, Calvin is there with his friend and Jared shows up with a broken arm. He and Calvin almost get into a confrontation. To avoid it escalating further, Calvin and his friend decide to leave and end up walking down the same road where two robbery suspects have run down to escape the police. They are then stopped by two trigger-happy police who think that they are the suspects. The scene then cuts to black. CJ mourns for Calvin and refuses to accept his death. She convinces Bash to go back in time to help prevent it. We can go back. We can fix it. We can save Calvin. The first attempt to rescue Calvin fails because of Jared making them late. Whoa! Don't shoot me. No, we're here. We, we need to go. We need to go. We need to go back to the alleyway. We're here. We're CJ, right. he's gone. He's gone. The second attempt, CJ and Bash warn the bodega owner that he will be robbed, but because he is also armed, the situation ends tragically for this timeline's version of Bash, causing Prime Sebastian to disappear. In the newest timeline, Sebastian is dead and Calvin is alive. We stay in this timeline for a while. Technically, CJ has accomplished her goal of saving Calvin, but Sebastian's life was forfeit. Calvin finds his own funeral program from the second timeline and demands to know the truth. CJ explains everything to him, and with the help of another friend, Eduardo, they work together to reset the time machine for CJ to go back to the alley where Sebastian is still alive, where both of them can go and rescue Calvin. Just be safe, Claudia. I don't want nothing to happen to you. It's okay. I see you yesterday. The third attempt sees CJ and Bash race to Calvin and show him the funeral program to convince him that he will die if they don't leave that street immediately. But 
they're too late. The police shows up and are even more aggressive than they were before as there's more people there. The funeral program changes from Calvin to Bash and Calvin makes a choice to stand up. The movie ends on a cliffhanger, with CJ running off by herself to jump back into time and try all over again. There's a lot of things to like and dislike about See You Yesterday. I like the acting of the two leads, Eden Duncan Smith and Dante Crishlow. They have great chemistry. They both were in the short film version. And in an interview with The Root, I learned that these two were actually childhood friends, like long time childhood friends, which really comes out on screen. I've known Dante since the day I was born. Um, he's the second person I met after I came out of my mother's womb on October 28th, 1999. The movie can be a hard watch, but I think it was handled rather well compared to other time loop stories about police brutality. The police are shown to be a looming threat. Their presence is felt very early on when CJ and Calvin are having an argument in the street and the police get involved. Instead of recognising that this is a very petty sibling argument when everyone is telling them that everything is fine, they instead try to escalate the situation by accosting Calvin. I can understand why people chose to avoid this one and why some even felt disappointed that they were robbed of a fun sci-fi adventure flick. I get it. It makes sense. The first quarter of this film does have that fun teen sci-fi adventure comedy type of feel. In another universe, this was a summer where two friends, CJ and Sebastian, are coming of age, getting into fights with school bullies. CJ is bonding with her older brother and gets to understand him a little bit more. And fun hijinks ensue with the time machine that they created all set against the background of this black joy summertime where it's Afro-Caribbean cultures on display in New York and it's cookouts and everything's just good. But then all that joy is disrupted by this evil and oppressive force that is the police. And of course, all of that is intentional with this movie. It's saying we could be having fun, but look at what we have to deal with. I appreciate that the deaths involving Calvin and Sebastian aren't gratuitous. I've watched Two Distant Strangers and... I did not like it. <laughs> Most of the deaths that happened were off screen or framed in a way where you just see the character's reaction and the aftermath. There's only one time you see the trigger being pulled and then bullets entering a body. I'd argue that the final death had to be shown to have a great impact for us, the audience, and for CJ as it only strengthens her resolve. The ending is tragically bittersweet and I have to admit, I actually like it. It reminded me of other tragic time loop coming of age stories about teenage girls trying to save a loved one. Life is Strange, the 2006 adaptation of The Girl Who Leapt Through Time, Madoka Magica. CJ is headstrong and stubborn, a personality trait that gets her into trouble, but also stops her from giving up, just like many similar protagonists that I have admired. CJ chooses to endure the hell of a possibly endless cycle to save her brother because she has hope. Because of her scientific mind, she sees this as a problem that she can solve. She has all the determination and refuses to give up because the only other option is to accept the evil that is police brutality. People like us never get to time travel. It's what white people do, like skiing or, or brunch. Time Wasters was a 2017 British show that aired on ITV and ran for two series. Created by writer and actor Daniel Lawrence Taylor, the show follows an unsuccessful jazz quartet from South London as they are mysteriously transported to 1926 at the height of the jazz era. During the mid-2010s, British sitcoms were becoming a little more high concept compared to the slice of life, flat share, school-based or office-based sitcoms that preceded it. New shows like Plebs, Crazy Head and the post-apocalyptic Cockroaches that Taylor also starred in were making a splash. Like many black writers in the UK, Taylor had a dream of creating an all-black sitcom as the landscape for us was practically dead. Initially, I did want to write a sitcom with uh, an all-black cast because there wasn't many on yeah. TV. Um, and yeah, exactly, I think so. <laughs> I think when I started, chewing gum wasn't even around at that point. Um, and so I think that was my main thing. In 2015, he began learning how to play the trumpet, which led him to becoming more interested in jazz music and the jazz era of the 1920s. In the early stages of writing, Daniel Lawrence Taylor wanted to call the show Black to the Future, naturally. But Universal was some haters and they said no. Then it got changed to Blackwoods and then finally settled on Time Wasters, which just works because 
they really were wasting time. The show stars Daniel Lawrence Taylor himself as Nick, the group's tightly wound leader. He desperately wants to get back to the present, but having an audience that actually enjoys their music is tempting him to reconsider. Okay, look, all I'm saying is that when people time travel, it's to prevent a natural disaster or to save mankind from extinction, not to perform as a Negro jazz quartet. Adelayo Adedayo plays his sister Lauren, the smartest one of the group. She keeps everyone in line and is trying to find a way to get rich in the past so the wealth can transfer over into the present. Right, well, looks like I'm gonna have to save the day, again. Just gonna wait for that moth to fuck off. Cardiff Kawan is Jason. He's the himbo and is just looking to get gal. Look, I know I messed up, I'm sorry, all right? but. I love her. What about the girl from Claire's Accessories? I love her too. Yeah? What's her name? Look, I know what this might sound like, but I do actually think her name's Claire. Lastly, there is Samson Kayo as Horace. He's the sweet one and is genuinely embracing this new adventure that he's having with his best friends. Welcome to Jurassic Park. Now, if you watch a lot of British TV shows and movies, you probably recognise these actors from things like Chewing Gum, Some Girls, Famalam and Bloods. I might need to do a video about Some Girls because that was really good from what I remember. Anyways, the first episode starts off with a cold opening, introducing us to these characters and their personalities. The cast have a natural rapport. I was certain that they knew each other beforehand, but that wasn't the case here. It was all truly lightning in a bottle the way they interact and how they play off naturally with each other. Anyways, the band's routine of bickering during rehearsal is interrupted by Horace, who bursts through the door and announces, I think I found a time machine. So there's this mysterious transient named Homeless Pete who has made a discovery of a time machine inside the elevator of a tower block. Of course, out of curiosity, the quartet follow Homeless Pete inside. As they wait for it to work, there's a very angry man named Curtis, who has murderous intent in his eyes, all directed at Jason. They narrowly avoid Curtis as a time portal opens up. The quartet are transported to 1926 and receive an expected welcome from the locals. The first thing the band does, of course, is scope out the scenery. I'm gonna scope the scenery out. To gauge just how far back they've travelled and how safe they are walking around. Nick is adamant about getting back to the present, while the others are keen to embrace this new adventure to explore and exploit their current predicament. Imagine all the things we could do. Invest in stocks and shares and get filthy rich in the present day. I was gonna say burn a witch. But, but we could do that. Yeah, we could do that. The band end up meeting fraternal twins Ralph and Victoria who invite them to perform at their birthday party. The band agree to it because it's a paid gig and Nick sets out on his own misadventure which sees him getting tortured by the inventor of television. Meanwhile at the party, the crowd grows restless and the man that the jazz quartet perform. Nick shows up in the nick of time, get it? And the quartet perform their rendition of Hey Ya by Outcast. The episode ends with the band having relatively settled into their new environment, ready to experience all the good, and the bad of the 1920s. Oh, and Curtis, from before, he managed to time travel too, and he's coming through like a roadman terminator. What are you saying? Not the best recap, I know. I am intentionally leaving out a lot because I do not want to spoil it for you, and I don't want to kill the jokes by retelling them in a worse way. Time Racers depicts a lot of racism of 1920s England in a very honest yet humorous way. Racism isn't the driving plot of the show, it's more of a background, like a supporting cast member. Yes, it's there, and they have to acknowledge it, but they aren't going to let racism steal their joy, just as we do in the present. So this right here, this whole thing here about the cannibals made me laugh, because in the Victorian era, Europeans loved eating Egyptian mummies. They just loved it. They ate so many mummies. They were the cannibals. Talk about projection. <laughs> Racism in England during the 1900s was wild. There were plenty of violent riots that happened to black communities and other people of colour. While Time Wasters does show some white people being normal, they don't shy away from depicting the harsh realities of black people that were treated as lesser because of the colonial stereotypes that they were fed to the world by colonial powers, such as England. Even famous performers were not exempt from prejudice. In 1923, American cabaret singer Florence Mills and her all-black variety act, The Blackbirds, came to London to perform at the London Pavilion. White actors and musicians that were in unions were so appalled and outraged by this that they complained to London City Council. 
a whole compromise was made where the white performers got to go on first and do their little thing and then Mills and her group would perform second. Like, can you believe this? They had a whole bitch fit just to be a mediocre opening act. <laughs> because even the critics were just like, yeah, I don't know what that was in the beginning, but Florence Mills, that was amazing. Ain't nobody coming to see you, Otis. The UK and most countries in Western Europe like to act morally superior to the USA when it comes to racism because they didn't have full-on violent segregation laws or anti-miscegenation laws. But just because interracial couplings weren't legally restricted, it didn't mean that it wasn't frowned upon. And it didn't mean that all those relationships were born from a place of mutual love and respect. The 1920s saw a rise of racial fetishization of blackness and black cultures. Negrophilia was all the rage. Think about how France embraced black American jazz musicians like Josephine Baker. That didn't stop the French from being racist to regular degular black people that lived in France and further exploiting Africans and Caribbean nations in their colonial areas. It was trendy and in vogue to have a jazz band perform at your party, to have stolen African art in your home and to show how worldly you are to host an Egyptian themed parties and of course having an exotic black lover meant you were adventurous. Jason and Lauren use the twins' fetish for them for their own benefits so they can live rather comfortably in the past. Lauren does a better job at it because she's smart. She keeps Ralph at a distance, never shows him any affection because she doesn't like him, tells him to go away, and he does. And he also leaves her all his money, so, <laughs> so good job. The show also touches a little bit on the sexism of the time. Lauren's present day style is quite casual. Jeans, trainers, hoodies. Some might say a little bit tomboyish. And in the past, she does opt for suits and tuxedos. She gets lumped in with the boys sometimes, which she doesn't seem to mind all that much. Female performers of that era did don tuxedos back then. So Lauren makes it work. It looks good on her. And occasionally we do see her in like flapper style dresses too. In episode four, Lauren is kept out of sight when the band performs at a gentleman's club and is paid less than her bandmates because she's a woman. The episode sees her gain a fan base of women, but then ends with one of them stealing everything about the band from the sound to their look in order to create an all white jazz band that goes on to be extremely successful because blackness performed by whites has always been very lucrative. She was campaigning for women to be recognized because women supporting other women is important, right? But it was all a facade. She wanted to be the one to stand out in the spotlight and the easiest way for her to do so was to step on the back of a black woman and steal everything that she was doing. The way this episode kind of reminded me of a certain someone. I'm not going to say who, but you can have fun guessing. <laughs> you lied to me all those times I said that I love you I have yet to talk about the music. The original soundtrack is stellar. It was composed by Nick Foster and you can listen to it all on his SoundCloud. And then there's all the jazz rendition of popular songs. My favourite was from Series 2 where in an episode, Horace invents UK Garage. Well, it'd rather sound something like... Hardcore, you know the score. Rhyme so good I deserve an encore. All about the style we bring will make you laugh like when you was a little child again. Smooth, that's how I roll. I got so much soul that when I step into the party. Oh, when I meet mean somebody, oh, when I meet mean somebody. What an incredible mind. Stop, higher lap ma, higher lap ma, higher lap ma. Stop, stop, stop. Switch. Done already. I cannot recommend this show enough. The first series is great. The second series, they completely switch things up by having the quartet travel to the 1950s where rock and roll music is a new hot thing and the band's music changes to a more cool jazz sound. We also see glimpses of the emerging Windrush generation in Britain. Both series have like six episodes that are like 25 minutes long. You can binge watch all of this in one day. Time Wasters was such a breath of fresh air to all the period dramas that were coming out at the time from the UK. I don't know what it is, but I am more inclined to watch a period show with black people in it if it's in the early 1900s, so 1910s, 20s, 30s. I blame Harlem Nights. And I blame Janet Jackson for making me want a zoot suit still to this day. I was really upset that there were only two series. It would have been nice to have a third one. Maybe they end up in the 1970s or something. That could have been interesting. So there was talk of an American version in the works where four modern day black New Yorkers travel to the Harlem Renaissance and try to make it big there. It was to be helmed by Lauren Ashley Smith, the head writer of a black lady sketch show, but unfortunately it never got picked up. That could have been something special. There isn't nearly enough films and television shows that are set in the Harlem Renaissance. The word is the future. The future. The future. The future. 
When I originally planned this video, the last segment was going to focus on the future. Not a story set in the future that has a black main character, or a story about a black main character from the future travelling to our present day. No, I was looking specifically for a story with a black main character from the present day who travels to the far future. Why that scenario? Well, it made sense for the narrative of this video. We started off with Kindred, where we see a character pulled back into the past. Then in See You Yesterday, we see a character reliving the present. And then we had Time Wasted and Black Knight, which both focus on the past as well. So it just made sense to end on a black time traveller going to the future. I considered the 2018 adaptation of A Wrinkle in Time, but they don't really travel to the future per se, it's more of an interdimensional travel. As for the 15th Doctor in Doctor Who, that has yet to premiere, so I can't really talk about that one obviously. Confession, I've never watched Doctor Who willingly. I had to watch it in school for you know, media studies and stuff like that. But I just could never get into it. Yeah, I knew early on to rule out TV shows, movies and video games. If there was something out there, I would have known by now. My best bet were books, novels and comics. And let me tell you, I searched. I searched up and down, but I could not find anything. I could not find anything that was in the scenario that I was looking for. Even just typing in black time travellers to the future into a search engine, it brought up people from the past travelling to the modern day. For example, both 4400 series and Siempre Bruja. Uh, I have scrolled through Goodreads and Storygraph list and even went through Will Smith's filmography. Maybe I'm just really bad at researching. I probably scrolled past an independent comic book that has exactly what I'm looking for. Perhaps there's some story out there with a bishop from X-Men. I think I was so set on finding a story about a black time traveller going to the future because it is the ultimate escapism within the genre. In the 4400, there are black characters from the 1920s and 1940s that come to 2021 and experience a world that only existed in their wildest imaginations, where they are free to do things that they never thought were possible. It's endearing to watch those characters view our present day with their new eyes. When we look around and see some things have changed, yes, but many things have stayed the same. And those who are in power right now are hellbent on dragging us back to the dark ages, decades ago when things were so fucked up. For us living in the now, living in this weird dystopian present, the future looks so bleak that it's non-existent. I suppose I'm trying to break away from the dystopia and seek a possible utopian world, or even an okay world. A far future where all social ills are gone, and that future feels possible because our proxy who's witnessing this brave new world came from our present. Basically, I'm asking for book wrecks. <laughs> And there are people who believe that we don't see ourselves in the future, but we have always seen ourselves in the future, whether it's Octavia Butler or Sam Delaney or any of these people. My husband said to our studio executive who told us that black people don't see themselves in the future, so they wouldn't like science fiction. And he said, no, that's not true. You're not absolutely wrong. Will Smith is the number one science fiction star in the world. But also he said, the past for blacks, the past is painful, the present precarious, but the future is free. We always see ourselves in the future. Your future that you're living in is because black people imagined it. And he said, you're welcome. You're welcome. Well, this took forever. Hi, everybody. I have returned. I was gone for a whole year due to health reasons. I explain it more on Patreon. And that episode, that podcast episode is free for everybody who's interested and wants to know why I, I was gone. Um, I'll leave a link to the description if you're interested. But yes, I'm back. I'm back to making videos again. Um, how are you? How have you been? Anyways, thank you to all my patrons who stuck around, even though you didn't have to. Um, I truly appreciate it. Speaking of which, let me thank all of you. Sergeant Rock, Quinn, Hyphenated, Des and Hill, Richard Campbell, Punk Rock Yeezers, Joel Fiennes, M. Zaid, Kemi, Mariah, Cheyenne Lynn, and Harry on Hook. Thank you to all of you. Yes, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video sooner rather than later. Bye.